Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to be in your presence. We've delighted as we've opened your holy word and studied about the three angels' messages, your last message to planet Earth. And Father, as we study about that great call in Revelation 18, come out of her, my people, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that you will especially bless those who are watching this programming on the different media. I ask, Lord, that you will open their minds and hearts to receive the truth as it is in Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for the promise of your presence because we ask it in the precious and holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to begin our final study on the three angels' messages by reading the passage that we have been studying during the last several weeks. Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 through 12. And then what we're going to do is bring everything together. We're going to see how all of these pieces of the three angels' messages fit together. And not only will we dwell on Revelation 14, 6 through 12, we will also say a few things about Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. Revelation 14 and verse 6 reads as follows. Then... I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water. That's the first angel's message. Verse 8, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then in verse 9, we have the third angel's message. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This is God's final message to planet Earth. Because as we're going to notice, as soon as the third angel finishes his message, Jesus is seen seated on a cloud with a sickle in his hand, and he's going to harvest the harvest of the earth, and he's going to harvest the grapes of the earth because they are ripe. In other words, these messages divide all of the human race into two groups. Now what we want to do is review very briefly the content of the three angels' messages. You'll notice that the first angel's message, first of all, presents the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We have studied the everlasting gospel. We notice that the everlasting gospel has to do with what Jesus did for us. Jesus lived the life that we should live. Jesus died the death that we should die. 
And if we receive Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord, His life counts as if it was our life, and His death stands in place of our death. In other words, the everlasting gospel has to do with the objective work of Jesus Christ. What Jesus did for us, He lived the life that we should live, and He died the death that we should die so that we could be accepted in the Beloved. And we noticed in our study that it's called the everlasting gospel because the plan of salvation was laid in the ceaseless ages of eternity past. You know, many Christians would want to stop with the first part of the first angel's message. Yes, it's all about the everlasting gospel. It's all about what Jesus did for us. But verse 6 does not end the first angel's message. You see, the first angel's message, the everlasting gospel, when it is embraced, it commands us to do certain things in response. And so in verse 7, we have that response that Jesus expects from those who have embraced the everlasting gospel. And so the, se the second part of the first angel's message says, Fear God. You see, that's our response to what Jesus has done when He lived on this earth a perfect life and when He died the cruel death that we should die. As a result of embracing the gospel, the command is given, Fear God. Now we've studied what it means to fear God. The basic idea behind fearing God is loving obedience to God because we stand in reverence and in awe of Him. In other words, fearing God means obeying God because we love Him from the bottom of our hearts. And we notice that that expression, fear God or the fear of the Lord, is constantly in the Bible linked with the idea of obedience to God's commandments. For example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it says, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment. Once again, fearing God and keep his, keeping His commandments are connected or linked together. So the first angel's message says, If you have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will fear God. But then you'll notice that the first angel's message continues saying, give glory to Him. In other words, not only fear Him to the point of keeping His commandments and obeying Him, but also revealing His glory, giving glory to God. And as we studied, we noticed that the only glory that we can give God is the glory that came from Him in the first place. We notice that His glory is His character. And when we have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms us. It changes us into His glory, and then we reflect His glory to the world. In other words, the call to give glory to God means to reveal the loving and wonderful character of God to the world. We use the illustration of the sun and the moon. You see, the sun represents God's glory. The moon would be us. The moon receives the glory from the sun, and then it projects the glory of the sun to the earth. In the same way, we receive the glory of Jesus Christ. We, in contact with Him, receive the glory of His character, and as a result, we project or we reflect His glory to the world. So the first angel not only calls us to obey God, it also calls us to reflect in the world the wonderful character of God. But the first angel's message also calls upon us to care for our bodies and for our minds. What we put into our bodies and what we put into our minds. Because that expression, giving glory to God, is also used by the Apostle Paul to say that we are temples. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we are to glorify God with our body and with our spirit or our mind because they belong to God. 
This means that we will be very careful about what we watch and what we listen to, what we allow to come into our minds. It also means that we will be very careful with our physical nature, with our physical body. We will follow God's laws of health because you need to have a healthy body to have a healthy mind. And so the first angel's message not only calls us to reflect the glorious character of God, but it also calls upon us to be careful about what we eat and what we drink. It should be, bring glory to God. But the first angel's message also tells us that we are now in the hour of God's judgment. You see, most Christians believe that the judgment is going to take place when Jesus comes, or perhaps even at the moment you die. Because they believe that when a person dies, uh, if the person was evil, they go to hell, or their soul goes to hell. If they were righteous, their soul goes to heaven. And there are other Christians who believe that perhaps your soul would go to purgatory to suffer a little while until your soul is cleansed and then it can enter glory. And some even say that for people who have not reached the age of accountability, their soul would go to limbo. But the fact is, the Bible tells us that the judgment begins at a certain point in human history. It begins, and we haven't studied this specifically, the date, but it actually begins shortly after 1798 in 1844. That's when God began the process of judging first the dead and ending with the living. So if the judgment begins at a particular point of time, and it begins with those who died first, Adam and all of his descendants, that would mean that Adam and his descendants did not go to heaven or to hell when they died, because if they went to heaven or hell when they died, why would God call a judgment to judge them if they've already been judged? So basically, the idea that we are in the hour of God's judgment brings to view another important doctrine, and that is that the dead know not anything. Because the dead are dead until the moment when their name comes up in the judgment and when they are finally rewarded when Jesus comes. In other words, when a person dies, they don't receive their reward. When a person dies, they go to the grave. Then in heaven they are judged, and eventually based on what is done in the judgment, they receive life or death when Jesus comes. This means that the dead are not anywhere except in the grave. So the state of the dead is involved. Basically, the first angel's message tells us that the dead are in the grave until Jesus comes. So there's no such thing as the immortality of the soul. So you would have to find a people in the world who are teaching that now we are in the hour of God's judgment. A people who teach that we're supposed to honor and glorify God by what we eat and what we drink. A people whose passion is to reveal the character of God. A people who are teaching that we need to keep all of God's commandments because we fear Him, because we respect Him, because we stand in awe of Him. And a people who teach that the dead know nothing. But there's another thing that is brought to view in the first angel's message. And that is a call to worship the Creator, the one who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. Now we've studied that to recognize the Creator, God gave us a sign. And that sign of the Creator was the Holy Sabbath. You see, you can't separate worship of the Creator from the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the sign of worship to the Creator. And so the first angel's message calls us to worship the Creator on the day which He has established, which is the seventh day Sabbath. So if you're looking for a people who are proclaiming the first angel's message, you must look for a people who are keeping God's holy Sabbath day. Let me ask you, does the first angel's message identify God's remnant people on this earth? It most certainly does. They are people who have a deep respect and awe for God, and they keep His commandments. They are people who say we're supposed to care for our minds and for our bodies. 
They are a people who say that we need to reflect the wonderful character of God to the world. They are a people who say that we are now in the hour of God's judgment. Nothing that people are judged when they die or when Jesus comes. The judgment is taking place now. There are people who say that the dead know nothing until the moment of the resurrection. There are people who teach that we're supposed to keep the Sabbath in honor of the Creator. This is the first angel's message. But then we have a second message, the second angel's message. The second angel's message actually speaks about Babylon. And Babylon is the opposite of the first angel's message. Now, we're going to discover as we study along that Babylon has three parts. And a little bit later on in this lecture, we're going to review what these three parts represent. The Bible tells us that Babylon is composed of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13. Now, Revelation 17 presents it with different terminology. Revelation 17, instead of the beast, speaks about the harlot. Instead of speaking about the false prophet, it speaks about the daughters of the harlot. And instead of speaking about the dragon, it speaks about the kings of the earth with which the harlot fornicates or has illicit relations. And so the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are spoken of in Revelation 17 as the harlot, her daughters, and the kings of the earth. And the second angel's message tells us that Babylon, this threefold system, is fallen. And it tells us the reason why Babylon fell. It says there in Revelation 14, verse 8, that Babylon is fallen because she has given all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Her fall is due to the fact that she gave the nations her wine. Now, we've studied what the wine of Babylon represents. In fact, we dedicated a whole lecture just to talk about the wine of Babylon. And we notice that the wine of Babylon represents her false practices and her counterfeit doctrines. Doctrines such as the idea that Sunday is holy. Doctrines such as the idea that it's possible for the living to speak to the dead or to pray for the dead such as the idea that it doesn't matter what you eat or what you drink, such as the idea that saying that God's law was nailed to the cross, such as the idea that God throws the wicked into an eternally burning hell. We studied all of this from the Bible when we dealt with the wine of Babylon. In other words, what I'm saying is, that the wine of Babylon is the opposite of the first angel's message. You see, the first angel's message presents, if you please, the wine of God, the unfermented wine of God. You see, the wine of God doesn't make people drunk. The wine of God makes people sober. And so when you drink God's wine, you assimilate His doctrines and the practices that are found in Scripture. But Babylon gives the nations fermented wine. She makes them drunk, which means her false doctrines and her false teachings make people drunk. And so, folks, the second angel's message is the opposite of the first. In the first angel's message, you have a people who practice the things that are mentioned in that message. The second message, in contrast, speaks about Babylon, who teaches just the opposite of what is taught in the first angel's message. In fact, you know that in the book of Revelation, we have two groups of three angels. You say, now wait a minute, we have two groups of three angels? Absolutely. The first group is the one that we're studying now. Let me ask you, what is the purpose of these three angels? Folks, if you continue reading, you'll notice that the purpose of the three angels' messages is to gather the whole world on God's side. 
It's a message to the world to tell people, hey, come over to God's side. But there are three counterfeit angels. They also go to all of the world to gather the world on the side of the beast, on the side of Satan. You say, where are those three counterfeit angels? They're found in Revelation 16, verse 13, where it speaks about three evil spirits like frogs. Who are these evil spirits? The evil spirits that Jesus cast out were fallen angels, folks. And so it says that th these three evil spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. Let me ask you, what is it that comes out of your mouth? Words. And so out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, come these teachings that are inspired by three, three counterfeit angels to gather the world on the side of the beast, on the side of Satan. So basically, you have to decide whether you accept the three angels' message of God or whether you accept the wine of Babylon. And then, of course, we have the third angel's message. It is the most dire and severe warning that we find in all of the Bible. And you know, some people say, well, you know, talk to me about the love of Jesus. This third message is a message of love from Jesus. You see, warnings are also messages of love. Even if they are drastic and strong warnings, you know, sometimes you need strong medicine. You know, it doesn't exactly, uh, you know, when it's bitter in the mouth, you know, you say, oh, this is terrible. But I'll tell you what, the disease is worse. And so sometimes God gives us a message which is strong, which hits us hard. But the purpose of the third angel's message is that we do not end up worshiping the beast and worshiping his image and receiving his mark and the number of his name because those who worship the beast and his image and receive the mark and the number of his name are going to receive the unmixed wrath of God and God does not want anyone to suffer his wrath. And so he sends this message. He says, Babylon has fallen. Don't receive the mark of the beast. Don't worship the beast. Don't worship his image because you will receive the unmitigated wrath of God. Now, the third angel's message mentions several powers. It mentions the beast, worshiping the beast. Now, we dedicated a whole lecture to talk about the beast. And we notice biblically, without a shadow of a doubt, that the beast represents the Roman Catholic system. I'm not talking about the individuals in the system. There's a lot of God's true people in Babylon. In fact, we're going to notice that before we draw this to an end. Many of God's true people are in Babylon. They belong to the beast. Or they're within the beast power. I shouldn't say they belong to the beast power, but now they are part of that system. There are many people who are in the system which is called the false prophet. There are many of God's true people among the kings of the earth, the secular powers of the earth. And we're going to notice that God gives these people a call to come out. And so we notice that the beast power represents the Roman Catholic papacy as a system, a power that ruled for time times in the dividing of time, or 1260 years from 538 to 1798, and a power who received a deadly wound, but whose deadly wound is going to be healed, and everyone on planet Earth who is not on God's side will worship this system. But we also notice in the third angel's message that there is a second beast. This is a beast that rises from the Earth, has two horns like a lamb, which we notice represents two kingdoms, one nation that recognizes two kingdoms that Jesus recognized because they're two horns like a lamb, and horns represent kingdoms. We identified this power beyond any shadow of a doubt as the United States of America, who in its founding documents taught and still teaches to this day that in the United States of America there are two separable kingdoms. 
There is the kingdom of the church, and there is the kingdom of the state. And they exist in the same nation, but they are to be kept separate one from another. Render therefore unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. But this beast that rises from the earth will have these two horns like a lamb. It will confess externally that it believes in two kingdoms. But we're told in the prophecy that it will end up speaking like a dragon, which means that it will make an image to the first beast. It will have a love relationship with the Roman Catholic papacy, and it will implement in the United States the principles of the papacy. It will no longer separate church and state. It will join church and state. It will make an image of the first beast. Now, if you look at the first beast, what characterized it is that during the 1260 years, it used the power of the sword or the power of the state to persecute those who were not in harmony with her. So if this beast from the earth is going to make an image of that first beast, it must mean that she's going to join church and state, and she's going to enforce the principles of the first beast. And then, of course, we notice in the third angel's message about the mark of the beast. We actually had two lectures on the mark of the beast. And we notice that the mark of the beast is in contrast to the seal of God. The seal of God is found in the fourth commandment of His law. You need three things for a seal. The name of the person, his office, and the territory over which he rules. There's only one commandment in God's law that has those three characteristics, and that is the fourth commandment of God's holy law. In other words, the seal of God is the seventh-day Sabbath, which means that the mark of the beast must be an opposite sign that the beast has of his power and his authority. And we notice that the beast, the Roman Catholic papacy, claims that its sign of authority is Sunday as the day of rest. And then we studied about the number of the beast. We notice that the number is connected with his name. It's the number of his name. And we notice that his name is vicarious Philly Day. We dedicated a whole lecture to this. It was quite a while ago. But we notice that vicarious Philly Day, the number value of those Latin letters is 666. And by the way, that name, according to the papacy, is what gives it authority to do things on earth in the name of Jesus such as the idea that it has the power to change God's law. You ask the papacy, who gave you the power to change God's law? They'll say, because we have on earth the vicar of the Son of God. He represents the Son of God. Therefore, he can do what Jesus does. So you see, the name and number is related to his claim to having power to change God's holy law. Beware of receiving his number. And then we notice at the end of the third angel's message that whoever drinks the wine of Babylon, whoever worships the beast and his image and receives his mark and the number of his name will suffer the outpouring of the unmitigated, unmixed wrath of God upon those who did not receive the gospel and who did not receive the three angels' message. And we notice in the third angel's message that there's a reference to being tormented with fire and brimstone before the angels and before the Lamb, and not having rest day or night. Those who worship the beast and his image and received his mark and the number of his name. And we did a full study of what this is really saying. You see, most churches teach that those who are in apostasy against God in the end time are going to burn in the fires of hell forever and ever and ever and ever, and they're never going to go out. But we studied this very carefully, and we noticed that even though the torment is going to be long, the suffering is going to be long, eventually the suffering will come to an end. In other words, hellfire is not a place where God tortures people throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. People will be punished in the lake of fire 
according to their works, according to Scripture. And then, of course, we have the conclusion of the third angel's message. Do you know the conclusion of the third angel's message brings to view the remnant of Jesus Christ? Notice the characteristics of the remnant. Revelation 14, verse 12 speaks about those who have what? The patience of the saints. Why are we going to need patience? Folks, we studied a whole lecture on the patience of the saints. God's people are going to go through the tribulation. It's going to be the worst period in human history. Even the most fertile imagination cannot imagine what the tribulation is going to be like. It's going to be like the, the time when the three young men were thrown into the fiery furnace. Well, let me make it clear. God's people will not suffer the wrath of God. They will live on the earth when God is pouring out His wrath, but they will be shielded by divine power, just like the three young men were shielded by divine power. But they will have to be on earth and their faith will be severely tested. But they will stand. They will have the perseverance, which is a better translation. They will have the perseverance of the saints. They will hang on, and they will not give up. God's remnant will have the patience of the saints. But then the last part of the third angel's message also says that they keep the commandments of God. And we studied a whole lecture on the commandments of God. And we notice that the expression, keeping the commandments of God, refers to the Ten Commandments. In other words, God's people are going to keep the Ten Commandments. So much for the people who say that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. Or that Jesus was the one who kept the commandments, so we don't have to keep them. Or that we don't have to keep the commandments because we're not under law, but we're under grace. That we don't have to keep the commandments, that's just the letter, but we live by the Spirit. You're making a liar out of God because God says that He will have a remnant that have the patience of the saints and keep the commandments of God. It is possible to keep God's commandments according to Revelation 14 and verse 12. And then another characteristic is given of the remnant. It says that they have the faith of Jesus, which when we studied, we noticed that it is faith in Jesus. Jesus. That's the correct translation, faith in Jesus. You see, if you had only that they keep the commandments of God, you might reach the conclusion that this is legalism. But you see, you can't keep the commandments of God unless you have faith in Jesus. We dealt about this issue of faith and works. Keeping the commandments of God would be the works. But you can't keep the commandments of God unless you have faith in Jesus. Jesus. In other words, faith in Jesus is what empowers you to keep God's holy commandments. And so God will have a people that have the patience of the saints, a people who keep the commandments of God, but they don't keep them legalistically like the Pharisees. They keep the commandments of God because they have faith in Jesus. And then there's another characteristic which is not found in the third angel's message, but it is found in Revelation 12, 17, which is a parallel verse, and it's also found in Revelation 19, verse 10. The remnant of God also have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we notice that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the gift of prophecy. In other words, God's remnant people will have a prophetic voice in their midst not to add to the Bible, but a prophet that will enlighten, amplify, explain, correct those who go astray from Bible truth. The remnant will have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. So God's people will have definite characteristics. If you want to find the true, find the true church, you have to find a church that teaches that we're supposed to fear God to the point of keeping His commandments. A church that teaches that we're supposed to be careful with what we put in our bodies and what we put in our minds. A church that teaches that we need to reflect the glorious character of God. In other words, it's not enough to just believe what Jesus did. We need to reveal His character. We need to have a sanctified life. Not justified, but also sanctified. 
It has to be a people that believe we're in the hour of God's judgment. It has to be a people who believe that the dead are dead until the resurrection. It has to be a people that proclaim that Babylon has fallen and they teach contrary to the wine of Babylon. It has to be a people who teach that we're supposed to keep God's commandments, a people who have faith in Jesus, a people who have the patience of the saints, a people who have the prophetic voice in their midst. I tell you, there's not very many options out there if you're looking for a church that has all of these characteristics. Now you say, Pastor, why does the message of Babylon appeal to so many people? Because we must admit that most people are not on God's side. Most people are on the devil's side. What is it that appeals to Babylon that would lead most people to embrace the teachings and the practices of Babylon? I have this interesting statement that's found in this classic book on Bible prophecy, The Great Controversy, page 572. Listen carefully to what it says. Remember the third angel's message has a balance between having faith in Jesus and keeping the commandments of God. Listen, folks, it's dangerous to go to either extreme without the other. If you teach that you have to keep the commandments of God, but don't have faith in Jesus, you're a legalist. But if you teach, I've got faith in Jesus, I don't have to keep the commandments, then you believe that you can be saved in your sins. So you have to have both. Do you know what really appeals in people's minds? What really appeals is the idea that they can be saved by their works or they can be saved in their sins. That's the genius of Babylon. Let me read this statement. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants, because they're playing with fire, folks. Protestants in the United States are playing with fire when they draw close to the Roman Catholic papacy. They don't have any idea what they're doing. They'll only wake up when it's too late. He says, a prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and to shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit now they think, I'm right. That they feel no need of humbly seeking God, that they may be led into the truth. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, they are ignorant of both the Scriptures and of the power of God. They must have some means of quieting their consciences, and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. What they desire is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. The Apostle Paul described this as people who will have a form of godliness, but they will not have the power of godliness in their lives. In other words, people who go to church people who go through all of the forms of religion, it looks that, like they're very religious, but they're lacking the power that transforms and changes the life. So she says, what they desire is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. Not the needs, but the wants. Notice their terminology. The wants of all of these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits and those who would be saved in their sins. Here is the secret of its power. Are you catching the picture? This is exactly contrary to the third angel's message. Third angel's message says you have faith in Jesus and you keep His commandments. This system says all you need is to profess faith in Jesus, 
or you don't have to keep the commandments, or keep the commandments, but you don't have to have faith in Jesus. In other words, it's a system that appeals to the desires and to the wants of most everybody in the world because people would love to have their cake and eat it too. And that's exactly what this is talking about. Now, do you know that towards the end of human history, the message of the second angel is going to be proclaimed again with power? And I believe that now we have arrived at that time. The second angel's message basically proclaimed that Babylon was fallen, was fallen. We read it in Revelation 14, verse 8. But the Bible tells us that very close to the close of probation, this message is going to be proclaimed again. And there are going to be some additional things said when the message is proclaimed again. Now let me say that the three angels' messages began to be proclaimed around the year 1844. You know, people arose that began proclaiming all the things that are in the three angels' messages. That church is the Seventh-day Adventist church, by the way. These messages have been proclaimed practically from the origin of the Seventh-day Adventist church. But at the end of time, these messages are going to be proclaimed again to the world in power. I'd like you to notice how the Bible describes this warning. And before we read it in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, allow me to tell you that this passage that we're going to read is in a very special context. If you look at what comes immediately before Revelation 18, 1 through 5, you're going to find Revelation 17. There it speaks about the harlot sitting on many waters. She's controlling the nations of the world. She fornicates with the kings of the earth. She's clothed in purple and scarlet, and she has decked with gold and silver and precious stones. And everything's going well. Her and the kings of the earth are all on the same page. Her daughters do what she says. The kings of the earth do what she says. The multitudes upon whom she sits do her bidding. Everything is going well. But then there's this pesty group who are the fly in the ointment, the feather rufflers, who are actually saying that this system is fallen and that people need to come out from this system. You see, Revelation 17 presents the harlot and her dominion over the earth, which is the same as the beast and his dominion over the earth. Revelation chapter 18 says, when this time comes, make sure you're not in this system. It's an end time warning because the plagues are going to fall on this system. Now the interesting thing is that immediately before you have Revelation 17, which is speaking about the condemnation of the harlot at the very end of time, when God's wrath falls upon the harlot, her daughters and the kings. Immediately after, listen to this, immediately after Revelation 18, 1 through 5, you have the description of the fall of Babylon. You see, she had illicit relations not only with the kings of the earth, but also with the merchants of the earth. In other words, she controlled the commercial transactions of the earth. And you read those verses, and it speaks about the fall of Babylon from a commercial perspective. Revelation 17 speaks about the fall of Babylon from a religious and political perspective. And in between those two perspectives that speak about the final outpouring of God's wrath upon Babylon who fornicates with the kings and fornicates with the merchants of the earth is this warning to get out before that time comes. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And then notice in verse 2 what this angel has to say. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, 
a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Now, my question is, does this sound like a place that you would want to be in? Obviously not, because Revelation tells us that the wrath of God is going to fall upon those who are within this system, which according to the Bible at the very end of time will be filled with demons. It would be filled with evil spirits. Now the question is, why will it be filled with evil spirits? Verse 3 explains the reason. For, that means because, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So notice that the reason why Babylon falls, the reason why she's filled with every foul spirit, she's filled with demons, according to Revelation 18, is because she gave her wine to all of the nations, to the kings, to the peoples, and to the merchants of the earth. Now we've studied previously what the wine represents. The wine represents false practices and false doctrines that Babylon has. In other words, what leads to the fall of Babylon is her false doctrines. Now I want you, what I want you to notice is that the three angels' messages are in contrast to the wine of Babylon. In other words, the three angels' messages proclaim what we might call the wine of God, but it's not fermented wine, it's unfermented wine. Whereas Babylon presents false doctrines, adulterated doctrines, which means that this wine is fermented, and this fermented wine deranges the minds of people so that they cannot grasp and understand the truth as it is in Jesus. And now I want you to notice, there in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4, that even though Babylon gives her wine to all of the nations and the merchants and the inhabitants and the kings of the earth, God has a faithful people there within Babylon. You say, how do we know that God has a faithful people inside Babylon? The reason is very simple. Notice what we find in verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. Notice that God says here, Come out of Babylon, my people. Now, if God says, Come out of her, my people, it must be that God has people within these systems. Now, we've studied about Babylon. We've noticed that Babylon represents apostate religion. Babylon includes the kings of the earth. Babylon includes the merchants of the earth. So what God is saying is that among all of these groups are to be found faithful children of God who love the Lord, who don't know any better. And when this message is proclaimed for these people to come out of Babylon, they will gladly embrace this truth and they will come out of Babylon. And I want you to notice that if they don't come out of Babylon, the wrath of God will fall upon them without mixture of mercy. So this is a message which is extremely urgent because whoever does not respond to this call and come out of Babylon will not only be lost, but will suffer the terrible outpouring of the wrath of God. In fact, that's what we notice in verse 5. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. So she's going to drink the cup of the wine of the wrath of God without mixture of mercy. In other, in other words, double strength according to this. And then when this message is finished, the whole human race will be divided into two distinct groups. One group will have the seal of God, and the other group will have the mark of the beast. And this is where we have the scene of Revelation chapter 14 
and beginning with verse 14, where Jesus is seated on a cloud, and he has a sickle in his hand, and he's going to He's going to reap the harvest of the earth, which represent the righteous. He's going to reap them, and He's going to take them into the city of Jerusalem, spiritually speaking, Jerusalem, as we've already studied. In other words, they will be members of God's remnant, God's remnant church. But then the Bible tells us that there's another harvest, the harvest of the grapes, which represent the wicked they also will be harvested. In other words, you will have two groups, those who have the seal of God and those who have the mark of the beast. Those who have the seal of God will be gathered within the spiritual city of Jerusalem, within the remnant all over the world, and they will be shielded from the wrath of man, and they will be shielded from the wrath of God. But those who are spoken about as grapes will suffer the terrible outpouring of the wrath of God without mixture of mercy. Now Revelation chapter 14 and verses 14 to 17 speaks about these two harvests, the righteous and the wicked. And then in verses 18 through 20, we have the grapes representing the wicked gathered around Jerusalem. This is not talking about literal Jerusalem in the Middle East according to what we've studied. Being in Jerusalem is a spiritual state. It means that God's people are with the Lord. They have the seal of God. They keep God's Sabbath. They worship the Creator. In other words, they're on God's side. And even though they're all over the earth, they're spoken of as being in the city of Jerusalem, whereas all of the wicked are gathered outside the city of Jerusalem. In other words, they've surrounded God's people all over the earth. Now the question is, why have they surrounded God's people? Have they surrounded God's people on friendly terms or on unfriendly terms? When we go back to the book of Joel, which we've studied, we notice that the nations gathered in the valley of Jehoshaphat to attempt to attack and destroy God's people. And so after humanity has been divided into these two groups, God's faithful people will uh, be in this world during the outpouring of God's wrath, and the wicked will surround them with the intention of destroying them, but God will place upon them His protecting hand. In other words, they will not suffer the wrath of God, and they will not suffer the wrath of man. They will be protected in the midst of this terrible time in human history. Folks, the most fertile imagination cannot grasp what this time is going to be like. The Bible tells us that it's the greatest tribulation that has existed in the history of the world since the beginning of time, when the wrath of man and the wrath of God are manifested at the same time on planet Earth. And God knows that this is going to be a very trying time, and that's why He sends this message, Come out of Babylon, my people. Receive the seal of God. Reject the mark of the beast. Don't worship the beast. Don't worship His image. Because if you do, you will be among those who are lost, eternally lost. And then, of course, in Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 through 4, after the crisis is over, we find this group, which is called the 144,000, those who are alive when Jesus comes, those who remain alive during the tribulation, the Bible tells us that they will stand victorious, finally, on the sea of glass. Let's read Revelation chapter 15 as we draw this to a close. Revelation 15 and verses 2 through 4. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory, notice they have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass having harps of God. See, they're standing victorious now on the sea of glass. They're with the Lord in heaven. And then it says in verse 3, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. 
And so we have this final scene of the victorious living saints that will stand on the sea of glass with the Lamb, with Jesus Christ, having gained the victory over the beast, which represents this worldwide Roman system, Roman Catholic system. The victory over His image, which represents the United States of America making this image or this reflection of what the papacy was like during the Middle Ages. They will be victorious over the mark of the beast, which we've already shown is the counterfeit day of worship. And they will be victorious over his number. And of course, his number is linked or connected with his name. And that name supposedly gives him authority, even to the point of changing God's holy law, which no human system and no human being can do. And so God calls his faithful people in Babylon, those who belong to the political powers of the world, those who belong to the system which is called the beast, those who belong to the system of this second beast that rises from the earth, God calls upon them before his wrath is poured out to come out of Babylon and to join his remnant people who keep the commandments of God including the fourth commandment, who have faith in Jesus, who possess the patience of the saints, and who also have the guidance of the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. I pray to the Lord that as we've studied this very important series, that those who are watching this series of presentations on television will make their decision to leave Babylon and to join the remnant people of God.